relevance. Okay, and um, what you get, I mean, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the kind of the jargon of uh, European science policy, uh, there is this distinction that's made between mode one and mode two knowledge production. Right, um, and the idea here is that mode one is this kind of internal discipline based kind of knowledge um, and mode two is where the, the, uh, the, no the imperatives for, for producing knowledge comes from outside the academy and the academy in a way operates in a responsive mode right and, and in that transdisciplinary environment you know a lot of the differences between disciplines start to fall down because you realize there are these other things that if any of us are going to be able to solve and, and get funding and, and continue our own livelihoods, we will need to cooperate with each other. Okay, and this operates as a kind of external attractor to academic work. And as it were, steers the academy away from the production of knowledge for its own sake to whatever happened to be the societal or economic goals at a given moment. And this is the context in which transdisciplinarity has become very important in European policy circles. And I think, you know, the most, most obvious way to see this is if you see, I mean, this is not just true at the European Union level, this is true at all the sort of national levels as well. I mean, it's true, you know, in, in Britain, we have the Economic and Social Research Council, and as you, if you look at the, uh, the sort of the, 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 the titles that are given to the various research calls, over the years, they have moved away from disciplinary names to things that are important, like sustainability, right? You know, economic growth, right? I mean, you know, terms that, you know, that in a sense um, are not defined, they're not necessarily technical terms within a particular discipline, but rather they're sort of general policy concerns, and then different disciplines can kind of go for them. Okay? Um, and this is the context in which interdisciplinarity is being promoted today as a vehicle for the transdisciplinization of knowledge. Um, now, people think of this often in very positive terms uh, in the sense that, and it's certainly this is the official rhetoric, the official rhetoric is, well, isn't it great that, you know, we now have these ways of defining what the point of knowledge production is that pulls us away from the very narrow specialized terms of the academic disciplines. Right, and so what you're, what you're being asked to imagine here is that you've got two alternatives. You've got either the mode one world where the academics are just specialized in particular disciplines, don't care about anything else happening outside those disciplines, or you have this transdisciplinary world where in a sense the academic categories are sort of put to one side and all the important issues are defined in some societally relevant terms. What you don't have anymore is the idea that within the academy itself, there may be some drive to a kind of unification of knowledge because the unification of knowledge might be a way of empowering human beings, generally speaking, regardless of the particular social and economic imperatives of the time. Okay? To go back to the 1960s, what made interdisciplinarity so radical in the 1960s was the fact that the academics who were promoting it were saying, look, we aspire to a kind of universal, empowering knowledge, and there are things that we know are missing. We're not talking about women, we're not talking about blacks, whatever. And we've got to bring them into the mix. That's quite different from saying, you know, that there are these issues out there, these problems that need to be solved, and you academics have to, as it were, reorient yourselves to do them. Because in the latter case, the academics are no longer autonomous, they are instrumental. Right? So de facto, right, most of the drive for interdisciplinary research today is part of the instrumentalization of academia. There's no doubt about it. Okay? Um, now, of course, people can negotiate this in various ways, but nevertheless, that is the point. Right? There wouldn't be this much popularity, because interdisciplinarity within the academy itself is a radical thing and potentially socially destabilizing, as it was in the 1960s. Okay, but, but this is a different notion. This is a notion where, in a sense, 
it's not interdisciplinarity, it's almost like anti-disciplinarity. It's, it's sort of saying, look, you academics have to reorient your line of research to fit these kinds of problems that happen to matter now. As if we were just sort of here for hire, in a sense. You know, to be hired by whomever happens to be paying. So the whole autonomy of academic inquiry is being destroyed in the process. This is very much felt, I think, in the UK and, and other places, um, especially when these kinds of imperatives get taken on board by national funding councils. Because, of course, you know, if you look at the history of, of funding for research, um, you know, in the, in the last 100, 150 years, you, of course, have the very important um, charitable trusts and foundations. You know, we could talk about the Wellcome Trust and the Upfield Foundation in the United Kingdom funding medical research. Rockefeller Foundation, the Ford Foundation in the United States, right? These foundations are quite explicitly devoted to addressing certain kinds of large-scale social, economic, whatever problems, but, but, they're, but they are, as, as it were, outside of the government structure that normally maintains the universities. But now what we find is that the national funding councils have adopted this kind of strategy as well. So the, the, the difference between the way in which the research imperatives are set between the private and the public foundations are, are very, there's, there's hardly any difference anymore. So what this means then is that, that um, you know, academics, I think academics in a sense are people who are very easily um, led to self-deception, you might say, because in a sense we know so much, right? And so when we hear interdisciplinarity, we hear about the opportunity to collaborate with disciplines and so forth, uh, we find this is a kind of liberating thing. And under certain contexts, it is a liberating thing. But it's not at all that this, not at all clear this is the context in which it's liberating. Alright? And, and one wants to know about what the long-term consequences are. So to give you a sense of the, of the United Kingdom, for example, as you know, in the United Kingdom, since 1992, we have sort of removed the distinction between the old universities and what were the former polytechnics and schools of education and things like that. We call everything a university and we have a sort of common way of evaluating all of them now. Now one of the ways in which these sort of new, so-called new universities uh, adapt to uh, changing funding environments uh, is that they have very loose disciplinary structures in the universities. Okay, And very often they end up coming up with departments and and, uh, and, and, and research areas and, and, and degree programs that are very clever, right? They're very interdisciplinary, they're very, but they're very market-oriented. So they look really impressive, you know, kind of on paper, and they'll last for about two or three years, and, you know, and there'll be a few innovative things there, but there is no incentive to carry it through, to make it a foundation of a new body of knowledge, Right? It looks very much like you're just inventing new fields, new ways of doing things just to suit the moment, and you're going from one to the other to the other to the other. And what happens in the process is that, in a sense, the, the role of the university, as the sort of, regardless of whether it's discipline-based or interdisciplinary, the idea of the university as providing a long-term collective body of knowledge institutionalized for the society as a whole disappears because the internal structure of the university dissolves. It's just getting shaped all the time. And, all, and, and each of the different formations are interdisciplinary and are kind of intriguing and interesting, but there is no follow-through. There's no long-term development. It just lasts a few years and then people just do something else. Okay? Um, and so it seems to me that in a sense what is happening here by the way in which interdisciplinarity is being promoted in this transdisciplinary way, externally driven, is that it is sort of gutting the university. It is, it is destroying the soul of the university as an institution that is dedicated for the long-term production and reproduction of knowledge and collective growth of knowledge. Because, in a sense, the, you know, the, the institutional memory is constantly being erased and then reinscribed. Disciplines don't last very long. Interdisciplines don't last very long. So what is there that's continuity? You see, and that's always been the strength of the university as an institution that provides a kind of collective basis for knowledge that future generations can draw on and build on. 
and here you see this is where the disciplinary structure has some value, is in this context. But that is dissolving, you see, in the name of interdisciplinarity that is very externally directed. And I do think that this is something that one needs to take on board here, because I do think that the calls for interdisciplinarity now are indeed very exciting. And there are a lot of incentives to break down traditional barriers uh, between researchers working with each other. And that is to be welcomed to a certain extent. But it seems to me you have to be very mindful of the political economy in which this is being done, and what is likely to be the long-term consequences of this, unless there are, all, there are also strong institutional structures in place to maintain the integrity of the university. Uh, and where this starts, to be honest with you, and I'll, and I'll close my remarks here and then open it to questions, is university administration. The, who, the, the people who stand for the university, right? Uh, the, the rectors, you know, all the people under him, right? The people, those people, what are they defending when they're defending the university, right? Are they doing something more than just trying to show they're making a profit, right? What kind of, you know, how is the university being run? The more it gets run like a firm, right, um, the more problems we're going to run into because it's going to be quite easy for people at the top to kind of do cost-benefit analyses as to whether certain bodies of knowledge ought to be allowed to continue. And so here I think uh, one of the things that I would suggest is that given that there is all this external pressure for, for universities to dissolve their disciplinary boundaries, and to encourage interdisciplinarity, it becomes more important than ever for people who are university administrators to sort of get a clear sense of what the difference is between good and bad interdisciplinarity. That is to say, interdisciplinarity that actually renews and refreshes the university in its 800-year mission to reproduce and advance knowledge for all of society versus the bad interdisciplinarity that basically just makes at the university a kind of a, another proxy for a research park or a think tank. Okay, and I think that's the challenges before us today in terms of how we think about interdisciplinarity. And I'll, and I'll, I'll stop there.